Good Shabbos again, everyone. It's a pleasure to have all of you here with us this evening. It's hard to believe that it's been two years so we've had the opportunity to bring in a visiting scholar. As you know, it's often been the custom in our congregation going back several decades to bring in at least one, often two, sometimes three scholars from across the world to come to Beth Yashurn and to share with us and to inspire us. But because, of course, of the pandemic, we've not been able to do that until now. And I believe we picked an incredible scholar to join us this weekend. Dr. Manaz Afridi earned her PhD in religious studies from the University of South Africa. She currently serves as Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College in Riverdale, New York. Her research interests include the Holocaust, interreligious identity, post-genocide identity, diaspora and transnational studies, and feminist post-colonial theory. Her publications and presentation have focused on the Quran and human rights, Islamic literature and culture, Judaism and Islam, and Holocaust and anti-Semitism. She's the author of the book, The Shoah Through Muslim Eyes. Her focus on keeping the memory alive of Holocaust survivors has involved the work of students, community, and local survivors. Please join me in giving a Beth Yashurn welcome to our scholar in residence, Dr. Manaz Afridi. <clears throat> Shabbat Shalom. I just want to say that I was promoted to full professor, so I'm no longer assistant, which is a big deal in academia, I just want to tell you. So. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Strauss and other people I've met tonight. Um, Cantor is just beautiful. It's magical. You make me want to dance and move and think about God, and that's really amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jennifer Rosenweig. Where is she? Is she here somewhere? No, there she is. She's been amazing um, and trying to get me here for the last two years. So I really, really appreciate all the work because people like you make these things happen. Um, so I am really grateful. And thank you so much for coming uh, tonight. And I hope that we can spend some time talking. And also, I can share some things uh, about myself and how I came to this work. But more importantly, perhaps what we can do uh, with this kind of work and how we can act in the world. So I kind of feel like I'm in a sukkah of peace um, after that beautiful um, Shabbat service, and I've been so fortunate to be able to be part of a lot of Shabbat services. And I w as I was praying with you and reading with you, uh, everything that we were reading and praying could also be included in Muslim prayers. So I want to share that with you uh, very strongly, because today is Jummah for us. It's, all, it's our day of prayer as well, and sometimes we have longer prayers, but it's during the day, not at night that much. So. For me, being in a synagogue or a temple is a very comfortable space. Um, it's a very comfortable space in terms of who I am um, as a Muslim, but also a comfortable space in terms of the connection I have with Judaism itself. So I want to start with a quote by, uh, by Albert Memmi the, uh, from The Pillar of Salt, which was written in 1952. He says, our memories of things impose some order on the past and give it its meaning. Memory is the cornerstone of what and how we humans think about the past. This is true of our own personal memories and of the memories of our parents, or our communities, our traditions. Memory is also a central concept in the three religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Judaism, as you know, it is Zahar, to remember God and Israel, which is incumbent for Jews, and memory is mentioned 169 times in the Hebrew Bible. For early Christians, the term was anemnesis. For Muslims, the word for memory is dhikr or dhikra. In all three religions, memory awakens something from the past in a manner that enunciates this prior word or event 
and thus makes it present in the here and now, even enabling the possibility of a glimpse into our hidden future. And I begin with this because I think it's a very important aspect of all of our traditions, but I think it's very important to me as a scholar in terms of the work I do with the memory of the Holocaust and memory of the testimonies and to expand actually Holocaust education into the Muslim world and non-Jewish world particularly. And that's what I'm interested in doing. The importance of memory does not lie only in religious texts, as you know. Memory provides all of us a path to follow to grasp our own identities. For example, one of my professors describes the memory of third-generation Holocaust survivors as the expression of a collective voice that enlivens and reanimates the past, both living and dead. On the borders of memory, such writers enter the fragile space of a memory not their own. Dr. Alan Berger, who actually is in, in, in Florida, was one of my professors when I was started in my graduate studies at Syracuse University. I was privileged to work with him as a teaching assistant. His insights and words of wisdom enriched my understanding of historical events I had not heard of before. So just to explain to you, when you're a graduate assistant, you don't get a choice in terms of who you're working with. You know, you get a scholarship and they just throw you with someone, you know, as a teaching assistant. So I got lucky because I actually TA'd for someone who was teaching post-Holocaust um, classes. I began to wonder if all collective memory was somehow the fragile space of memory, not their own. In any event, I developed a strong interest in Muslim memory of the Holocaust. Memory and history became important to me through the study of the Holocaust and its survivors. And I remember meeting Michael Berenbaum, who is um, very well known for his work on Holocaust studies, but he also has, you know, was behind the DC Holocaust Museum. And he happened to be an adjunct where I was at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And it was September 25th, 2003, now a long time ago when I met him, and it was the day that Edward Said, uh, the Christian Palestinian, had passed away. And he was remembered, I mean, Said is known for his Orientalism and work that he's done, and also he was a Palestinian that also was critical of Israel. But this meeting was really important to me. That was the day in which Edward Said died. Said justly remembered for his, repute, for his reputation of Oriental, Orientalism, the historically patronizing representations of the East by Western historians. Berenbaum wanted to know what I would miss about Edward now that he was gone. I replied that his death marked a great loss of a Palestinian Christian who had fought against shallow half-truths and false claims, whether such propaganda targets Palestinians or Israelis. Berenbaum agreed that stereotypes only lead to further stereotypes, but he also challenged me to focus on a richer dimension of Said's work, his collaboration with his friend Daniel Berenboim in a creative search for a just solution of decades-long Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Everyone knows that Baron Boim is a world-class pianist. I did not know that Edward Said was also a great lover of music and a very accomplished pianist. This common interest in art led the two of them to apply profound concepts of harmony and discord to the political reality of the contemporary Middle East. They had the idea of taking young, talented musicians from both communities, bringing them to Berlin, where Berenbaum was the director of the opera, to meet one another and make music together. In 2011, I became the director of the Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College. Some questioned whether a Muslim could indeed teach and carry out the lessons of the Holocaust. Some Jews were horrified that a Muslim would be great at guarding memories of survivors, but most horrific were the comments about, quote, you might as well as, uh, might as, well as hired a neo-Nazi. Anguished by this, I continued my journey and have just completed 10 years. The hate mongers have retreated and have perhaps realized that Muslims can indeed uh, be trusted with the memory and history of Jews. And I want to just stop there for a second, because I think this is an important thing. 
I wasn't totally surprised when there was so much backlash um, against that because of the mistrust that we have seen over the years, especially contemporary times between Jews and Muslims. But I want to say that in the 10 years I've been there, um, it has changed people's minds that were against it. And I think that's, that's something we have to, I had to learn that from myself. It was not something I had ever done before. And I think it's just that I just kept doing my work and, and kept being honest and, and walking the line of peace. And sometimes people would say, well, you know, um, maybe you should do something radically different. I said, why? Because sometimes when we just stay focused ethically, right? I mean, we just prayed about peace and we talk about, you know, the sukkah of peace. If we just focus on that, honestly, I think good things can occur. But for the young people here, you have to be patient. The role of Muslims in the Shoah is generally not well known, or is known only partially. Like most non-Jews, Muslims were perpetrators, bystanders, and rescuers during the Holocaust. For example, many are aware of the support that the Palestinian nationalist leader, Amin al husseini gave to the Axis powers in Germany and Italy during World War II. Few, however, are, are aware of Robert Satla's book, Among the Righteous, or Omar Baum's book on Morocco and memories. Reporting both stories of Muslims rescuing Jews in North Africa and of Muslim perpetrators who collaborated with the Germans in torturing Jews in camps in Tunisia, with the French in Morocco under the Vichy government. So this part of history is really important because it brings to us the history of colonization in North Africa, which was at that time Morocco, we're talking about Morocco, Algeria was an independent, and Tunisia, that were all under the Vichy government because the French were colonizing in those areas. And then it brings together the idea that actually there were camps in North Africa. And the question is, well, why was I interested in that? Well, I was interested in bringing Muslims closer to the story of the Holocaust, and not just saying, oh, we have nothing to do with it, it was all European, right? So geographically bringing it closer, bringing it to home in a sense, and also you know, being open as a Muslim and saying, yes, there were some, there were perpetrators. They didn't create the Holocaust, but they had to work under the Vichy government. And there were a lot of stories of betrayal that you can also read about. So I think this is an important moment for Jews and Muslims because it's during the Holocaust, it's during colonization, um, and it's a moment where Jews and Arabs, Jewish Arabs and Arab Muslims, are living together under the Vichy government with different laws, laws of uh, racial segregation um, together. And it's an incredible, incredible part of history. And I talk about it in my, in my own book and my work. And it's a very important part of history where it brings us to think about not just Europe, Western and Eastern Europe, but actually North Africa and the expansion of the Holocaust um, and how vast the Holocaust was. And I think we tend to forget. And I want to mention that there were a lot of heroes during the Holocaust um, that were Muslims. And I want to share some of those with you. Noor Inayat Khan was a South Asian Muslim woman. And she illustrates the courage of resistance, the first female radio operator sent to Nazi-occupied France. <clears throat> Khan was eventually arrested and sent to Dachau, where she was tortured brutally, but never disclosed even her own identity before she was executed for espionage activities. And there's a book called In the Spy Princess. It's very interesting. Sharban Basu documents the powerful story of a Muslim woman willing to give her life in active resistance to the Nazis in Paris. So, I mean, one of the things that I think we also need to realize is that Muslims did die during the Holocaust. And actually, um, two summers ago, I took 52, this is before COVID, everyone, 52 Jewish and Muslim women to um, Poland and Berlin. And I was there 
scholar, and I took them to Auschwitz, and we prayed there because there were 64 Muslims that were murdered at Auschwitz. Um, the museum at Auschwitz has that list, and I had them um, look for that. So what, what were they doing there, right? I mean, that would be the first question. Um, they were actually there looking for jobs, and they were caught because they weren't Aryan. They were just like anyone else. Roma and Sinti, gypsies were also Muslims. So Muslims would be persecuted right next to Jews. But this history of murder in Dachau, in Auschwitz, in Sobibor of Muslims is an incredibly small piece of something that most, even Muslims, don't know about. And when you bring it to them, they want to start saying, what are you talking about? But when you start to talk about these things with non-Jewish communities, they become interested in the geography, in the depth of the Holocaust in a different way. And this is what I try to do through educating people across the nation, at my school, in my classroom. I want to also share a really very important story um, that has to do with Muslims who risk their lives to save Jews, but also how Jews risk their lives to save Muslims. Here is one such story. Joseph Cavilio and his family are Sephardi, whose ancestors were exiled from Catholic Spain in 1492. They survived that tragedy because of the immediate response of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire to grant asylum to Jewish refugees. A little short <clears throat> of five centuries later, the Cavilio family lost their home in Sarajevo when it was destroyed by the German Luftwaffe in a bombing attack in 1941. Once again, a Jewish family was rescued by Muslims. Mustafa Hardaga and his wife, Zenaba, and his brother, Izzet, and sister-in-law, Bahiria, immediately welcomed the Cavilio family into their household and promised them hospitality and safety. I don't know the exact words that Mustafa said that day in his native language, Serbio-Croatian. The words of welcome that the Cavilos remember are in Spanish, mi casa es su casa. My house is yours. Neither family spoke Arabic, but the words accompanying hospitality in this culture, Ehlen Vahsehnen, more correctly expresses the full meaning of what the Hardagas did for the Cavilios by taking their Jewish neighbors into their home. The Arabic words Ehlen Vahsehnen mean more than you're welcome. As a formality after hearing the words, you say thank you. They mean something profound to anyone in danger. It's not like you've gone to an Airbnb where you will just have a meal and you'll say thank you. But it's really about safety, the security, the protection that Father Ibrahim or Ibrahim extended to two passing strangers by welcoming them into his tent. Ehlen Vahsanan are more like a blessing as in Hebrew, Baruch Haba. Blessed is the one who is here. In fact, twice blessed, both because the blessing descends on the giver and the receiver, and because the blessing means we will make things easier for you, Ahlan, now that you are part of the family, Sahalan, or more simply, facilitated living with a new family. Despite prominent Gestapo warnings of the death penalty for hiding or aiding Jews, the Hardagas carry out their promise in plain view or under the nose, so to speak, of the Gestapo who had set up their headquarters in the very same neighborhood. Eventually, the Sephardic Cavilio family found a way to get to Mostar, then under Italian control, where Jews were relatively safe, but not for so long. They also were um, executed there. Eventually, in 1984, the Cavilio family made Aliyah to Israel. That brings the story to two more extraordinary twists in the plot. First, when the Kavilios got to Israel, they reported the story of their survival to Yad Vashem, which certified the Hardaga family for recognition as righteous among the nations. Second, and this is really important, during the siege of Sarajevo from 1992 to 1996, described as an herbicide by shell fire that destroyed over 335,000 buildings, the Hardagas lost their family home and became refugees. Right? This is time forward. 
An official in the state of Israel heard of their plight and arranged for an offer of citizenship if these Muslims wished to come to Israel. The Hardagas accepted the offer gratefully, knew the words of welcome or Baru Kaba. I mean, that's an incredible story, right? We're talking about World War II, and then we're talking about in the 1990s. And what's interesting is the memory. We remember they saved us. Um, and also in Sarajevo, and I spent some time there um, because of the genocide, but also because how amazing um, the locals have preserved the synagogue, and they have the Haggadah there, um, and they have a museum about the history of Jews in Sarajevo. But it's amazing that this story is so buried, in a way, and, and not, nobody wants to talk about two different families, Jewish and Muslim, trying to rescue each other. Also, neighboring Albania was the only country, the only European country that saved all of its Jews. Albania is and was 70% Muslim and 30% Christian. Actually, Albania saved more Jew, had more Jews in Albania than before the war because Jews were escaping to Albania because they knew that they were being hidden. Almost all Jews living within Albanian borders during the German occupation, those of Albanian origin and refugees alike, were saved, except members of a single family. Impressively, there were more Jews in Albania at the end of the war than before. So Harvey um, Cerner has written a really good book. You should look at it. It's called Rescue in Albania. It was published in 1997. Direct Muslim memory of the Holocaust was virtually non-existent, but Holocaust scholars have taught us that memory catches us by surprise at times and at moments when we may want to revisit a particular event. Memory is situated. The place in which you remember an event shapes you remember it. The Holocaust is a large story that needs to be told from multiple vantage points. People remember the Holocaust differently in Berlin, Tunisia, Jerusalem, the United States. Since one's perspective is crucial to appreciating how one understands an event, I began to look at how Muslims came to learn about the Holocaust as a way of understanding what Muslims remembered and what they forgot. One of the most important reasons why I was led to study the Holocaust in Judaism is that I wanted to explore why anti-Semitism had emerged within Muslim communities, my community. Explanations are offered, but they are not persuasive or convincing because so much work has been done to create a reliably factual history of the Shoah. So my question is, how can one deny the genocide and silent screams of so many lives um, lost during the Shoah? As Deborah Liebstadt suggests, denial of the Shoah is a crime against our own humanity because it is an assault on truth and memory. What is it about humans that becomes undeniably repulsive when they deny the deaths of millions, knowingly avoid the evidence, and remain painfully silent? The silence that I refer to is the tacit silence and casual acknowledgments within Muslim communities and countries that the Shoah is a subject that is not discussed. And if discussed, must we be seen as, as relative to the discussion of others' suffering? To deny the suffering and loss of another human being is a failure on the part of humanity, and I think Jews also have this in their tradition. How best to undertake any teaching moment about these matters? I always ask myself that. Specific answers, of course, depend on the specific situation a teacher confronts. My general approach is to follow the structure of scientific method. I give them evidence, search for insight, testing hypotheses. I tell them, be attentive, be intelligent, be responsible, be reasonable, yet be self-critical. This is how I apply my method for teaching. Fortunately, there are examples of Muslims speaking up and sharing the facts about the Shoah with the Muslim world. And there is now a beginning and burgeoning little field, which is amazing, that Muslims are looking at um, the Holocaust, looking at memory in terms of Morocco, Algeria. So it's, it's just starting. It's a very, very tiny field. 
um, but it's there. And I don't know if you've heard of Mohammed Dajani, who is a Palestinian professor. He was at Al Quds University, and he took his students um, to visit Auschwitz in 2014. But when he returned, his car was set on fire, received death threats, and was forced out of his job at the university in East Jerusalem. And I'm in touch with him, and he has a really, he lives in Jerusalem now. He has a, Was a Wasatia Foundation. If you ever go, you should probably visit him because I think it's really very powerful. Or if you're taking a group, it's a very powerful moment. The controversy escalated out of hand because a Palestinian dared to read the show as an important event of significance to Palestinians. In a conference in Doha, the capital of Qatar, Dejani said, quote, you need to understand the other because reconciliation is the only option we have. And the sooner we do it, the better. Empathizing with your enemy does not empathizing with your enemy does not mean you sanction what your enemy is doing to you. That's his quote. Dijani raises another important moral concern. If we accept your suffering, does that mean we suffer less? Suffering is not an Olympic event. With winners of gold, silver, and bronze medals for endurance and survival, in fact, suffering is often caused by the denial of other people's humanity. As a scholar committed to the importance of academic freedom, moreover, I am saddened by Dajani's experience of being punished for promoting transcultural understanding of the Shoah. I add, however, that I also find curious a refusal of many people to acknowledge the conclusion of serious Israeli historians, such as Ilan Pape, who have documented <clears throat> the same in terms of the evictions of Palestinians. As I noted above, we have to use all the facts in order to talk. Passing to another issue may not have noted of the two Holocaust slogans, never forget, never again. We have made much more progress on remembrance than on genocide prevention, which is true, because I work on right now with the Uyghurs and what's going on with the Rohingyas. We have witnessed so many genocides, Armenia, Shoah, Cambodia, Rwanda, Congo, Bosnia, Darfur, Uyghur, Myanmar. That's just to name a few, by the way. In historical documents and journalistic accounts on television and radio, as well as internet coverage and social media, yet we distance ourselves and focus on the ordinary events of the world. Genocide awareness seems to have little if no effect on present day genocides occurring in Congo or when they were occurring, occurring in Darfur, even in Syria, even after all the overwhelming historical, journalistic, media evidence. All our educators can focus at several Holocaust and genocide museums where we can learn assortment of issues like prejudice. Every single one of my students has experiences that inform their awareness of these sort of problems. Many of them come to our college with years of unexamined prejudices. And here we're talking about our future, which I think is super, very important. We try to help them see that it doesn't make sense to have your mind made up in a fixed and hard prejudgment or judgment before you have heard anything about what happened. Um, so one of the things, as you know, I, I teach at Manhattan College, which is predominantly Catholic, is anti-Semitism when I teach the Holocaust. So there's a lot of sort of pushback from my students about anti-Semitism and Christianity. So you have to be very careful with what you're talking about, how you're doing it, right? And then I have Muslim students. Um, so when I taught, when I, I just created a class, which is now in the curriculum, it's called Muslims and the Holocaust. And it's packed because people are like, what is that, right? Students are like really curious about it. So I have Albanian students, I have South Asian Muslim students, I have um, Catholic students, and I have African American students, and it's a very interesting conversation about race, about racialization of the Jew, racialization of the Arab, the Holocaust, the systematic persecution of people. And I just want to say finally um, that one of the most amazing things that I have ever done in my life is to interview survivors, Holocaust survivors. Um, it has been such an honor for me. Um, the friendships I've created with these survivors have been amazing. And I, I think the, the, the conversation that I had with survivors was very different. Because a lot of the survivors that I interviewed 
had never talked to a Muslim. And they were completely like, wow. Um, would you, <laughs> the best was when Robert Clary, does everyone know who Robert Clary was? Okay, he's still alive, by the way. He was, played the French lieutenant, lieutenant on Hogan's Heroes. So he gave me his last interview. He's still alive, but that's, he just was curious why I wanted to do this. And he said to me, what is a nice girl like you doing following Islam? And I was like, wow. And he said, yeah, you know, don't they want to oppress you? But he came out as being completely secular and atheist, right? So we had a very interesting conversation about the perception of Islam, right? And this is with the Holocaust uh, survivor. So I had these incredible exchanges with people um, that questioned my own identity as a Muslim, because how could a nice girl be a Muslim, was the question, right? Or how could I be happy being a Muslim? And I thought, that's something I wanted to share with you. But I just want to end with this. I've worked with many Holocaust survivors, and I share now one of these precious experiences. And this is about Albert Rosa. He, um, he's Greek, and he's 92 now, and he was a, a tough fighter. So I looked into the sky blue eyes of Albert Rosa for three hours one day, and I did this several times with them, as he spoke about his experiences at Auschwitz-Birkenau. As I left him, he told me with tears in his eyes that he wanted someone to write his life story. Since he had very formal education and would not be able to express in writing his feelings in the Shoah, he asked me how can I express in words how I felt when my sister was bludgeoned to death in front of me by a Nazi woman or when I saw my elder brother hanging from a rope when I had tried to defend him. I looked into his eyes, which had penetrated my own eyes for hours in that day, and I wondered how could I tell his story? And this was a real question for me. How could I tell his story without diminishing the emotional and physical strength that enabled him to survive the horror of his life in the camps? He spoke of maggots crawling on his body, as he was ordered to move the dead Jewish bodies, the gold he stole from the teeth of the dead, the urine he saved to nourish the wounds inflicted by a German shepherd, the plant roots that he dug out with his fingers for nourishment, the ashes he swallowed from the crematorium he helped to build at Birkenau. As I began to write this book and, my, and basically my work, I really felt inadequate. And inadequate. And even paralysis emerges within me. Because how am I to give such traumatic events any life with mere words? How can I give the Shoah a life of its own without trespassing on politics, ethics, and the millions of victims? I was tempted to abandon this project because I feared that I could not do it justice. I tried to stop working on my book, recounting but all I wanted to do was recount a Muslim woman's simple acknowledgement of the terror of the Shoah, its dev devastating effects on its victims and their family members. You know, no one had really written about the Shoah in the Muslim world, in the world, just the facts, and I just wanted to put it in a book. In this moment of determination, I did what I had to do. I remembered an important question that Michael Birenbaum raised in The World Must Know. But what of those who were not there? The Holocaust cannot be reduced to order or even an overriding sense of meaning. The event defies meaning and negates hope. How then are we to approach it? This important question is one that I've asked myself for many years. The Shoah and its enormity have become a preoccupation. Even as I write this, I ponder what it is about Jews in the Shoah that compels me to undertake this task. One easy answer is that it is a corollary from my gratitude for, for many eminent scholars who both challenged me, but also my gratitude for the Jews in the Jewish community that have, that have acknowledged and accepted me. When I reflect further on this question, I hear the voices, I see the deep eyes, I feel the strength, the pride, the memories of men and women who have moved in unimaginable directions to reach a safe place where they can sit calmly and tell their terrifying stories to a stranger, a Muslim woman. When I left Albert's home, this is Albert Rosa, I gave him a hug. 
because my words of gratitude seemed too, too inadequate. He smiled as he hugged me back, and then he said, this is the first time in my life that I have hugged a Muslim woman. I told him that this should not be the last time, as Muslim women are really not so cold or segregated as people might think. Albert and I exchanged the first step in dialogue by humanizing one another through conversation and empathy. A Holocaust survivor, a Muslim woman, began not just to humanize, but to understand and acknowledge one another. Thank you. <laughs>